Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Galactic Storyteller. I want to thank everybody for joining and for the comments that we have had on previous uh, videos. I'm very grateful for the conversations. You guys have been respectful, you've been kind, and you've added lots of great input to the dialogue, which is what we're here for, is to learn. We've been talking a lot recently about MK Ultra mind control, in particular with the involvement of the CIA and the LDS Church. Not too long ago, I had survivor J.R. Sweet on, and you guys have really been very kind with his situation. Today, we are going to be talking to his wife, Kate Sweet. We talk a lot about the effects that mind control has had on the individual, and I think sometimes we might forget the importance of the individuals that are around them, their children, their spouses. How does this affect them in their day-to-day -day living? Well, today, Kate has been kind enough to join us, and she's going to answer some of those questions and tell us what it's like to actually be with these types of individuals that have endured so much horrific abuse and torture and what that's like, uh, especially as they go through the discovery process and then it's a joint effort in healing. So let's welcome Kate. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Madeline. Good to be here. Oh, so let's start at the beginning. You and JR met when you were quite young. Is that right, teenagers? We were, yeah. We were, well, barely in our 20s, I guess. He was 20 and I was 21. So, yeah. And we were both uh, working up in a beautiful mountain town, kind of a resort town. And we had summer jobs and a lot of young people up there, you know, camped out in the woods and then worked in town. And so it was usually lots of fun and and everything is a beautiful place and so um yeah we met up there and we spent a lot of time together and I don't know just kind of fell in love through the summer I guess and um and then so I mean so we had a great time had lots of fun and then later um we went our separate ways at the end of the summer but uh after a while we decided we really missed each other so I went down to visit him in Utah and after uh, we stayed there together for a while, and after a while, we did, uh, a week or so, we decided to get married. So, <laughs> and then you know we got married pretty pretty quickly after that. We were only it was like two weeks after that we just planned a simple wedding like at my parents' house, my mom's house. <laughs> I know, so it was very quick. You That's know, faster <laughs> than Mormon standard time. <laughs> I know, right. <laughs> It was very fast, but we were very happy together. You know, we really wanted to get married. So anyway, but um, as is a side, I guess, I wonder if people are curious, you know, my family wasn't involved. It was a normal family, wasn't involved with any of the satanic stuff okay. or rich, you know, or mind control or anything. So it definitely wasn't a, an arranged marriage or anything like that. I think, you know, his family, now that we know that I know the other side of JR's life, <laughs> yeah. I know that they might have had plans for him to marry someone else, or, you know, probably not me. So it was kind of, it happened so fast. I think they probably did, couldn't do much about it without yeah. revealing, you know, that they weren't totally normal. So. But you do come from just a typical LDS background. And I think you may have mentioned in our pre-interview that you weren't super active, but that was your your background. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. My family was Mormon and had cut like originally they came from Utah. We, I grew up in southern Utah, but I mean, southern Idaho. But um, so, yeah, we we're kind of generationally Mormon. They had been, my family had been pioneer Mormons, you know, and stuff. Okay. And so it was our family's religion, although my dad didn't go and my brothers didn't really go, but my mom and me did for quite a while until when I was a teenager, I stopped going. But okay. Did you guys have I the just, temple ceiling? We didn't, no. Okay. We just had, my brother-in-law was a bishop and he married us just in a regular ceremony. So okay. at my mom's house, so. So that's good. You yeah. were to sidestep that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was pretty much kind of out of the church. I didn't know about it. You know, I didn't really believe in it. So <laughs> okay. I didn't really want 
that. So. And so what were your first impressions of JR for the first maybe couple of years as you guys were dating, you got married? Did did everything seem great and typical to you? Or did you did you have any sort of questions as far as personality goes? Um, you know, at the beginning, the very early years. I don't remember much of anything that was odd, honestly. You know, I think he was so deeply buried, especially when he was young. It seems like especially was then. The, you know, on the surface, uh, in his normal personality, he was, you know, a great guy and and we were happy. So no, I don't remember a lot at the very beginning. Okay. But later, I started to see some things that were kind of odd, you know, but. When you say later, how much later do you well, estimate and the, what kind of odd things are you? Well, as the years went on, I guess there were just some things that were kind of odd. Like I noticed he had some trouble with um, addictions, like he had trouble with smoking cigarettes. It wasn't anything terrible, but he had some trouble with that. Or uh, he just did some things kind of compulsively, it seemed like, like he would sometimes like go and eat, usually we ate pretty healthy, but he'd go and eat a whole bunch of junk food. So, you know, like sometimes it just didn't seem like he was consciously choosing to do things. He just would compulsively go and do things or, um, and also he, through the years, he also always wanted to buy weird hats. That was a strange thing <laughs> everywhere we went. So that was kind of weird. Um, Explain a little bit about that. What do you mean weird hat? <laughs> Well, like he'd like he liked to buy these kind of funny hats that look like kind of mobster hats from the 1930s and 40s, you know, like I don't know. So like and fedora, he, yeah, like fedoras, yeah, okay. uh huh. And he'd buy those a lot, and <laughs> and he also kind of like those little Irish cap type things. But he really liked hats, and it is weird because now that he's remembered all his stuff, um, his he part of his program did involve programming did involve hats and his grandpa played the part of like the mad hatter in Alice oh. in Land and stuff like that you know so okay so there may there's probably a reason that okay he had this weird kind of obsession with hats and then um you know and he would he had trouble with conflict and he would most of the time be bend over backward nice you know, type of person <laughs> when he had didn't had a hard time having boundaries lots of times, you know, but sometimes he'd get really mad and upset about something, you know, and then he'd go to bed and go to sleep and wake up the next day and he'd be like, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, and it'd just be like, totally, he wouldn't care about it anymore. It was just really strange, like, yeah totally changed you know and sometimes there are things kind of we did need to work on or something but I was like well you know he doesn't <laughs> care now so it's hard to work in a conflict sometimes so uh, I mean a lot of people don't like conflict I'm I'm a person that as an empath I uh, I just try to stay away from that stuff if there's something that needs to be handled then I do it and it feels sometimes like it's under duress um, just because it, it has to be addressed. So that can be kind of, depending on your personality, typical. Would he ever come back and you guys would address the issue or was there compliance there? Or how, how do you mean? Well, um, you know, it was just interesting because it was so big, a big change. You know, he'd be totally like, I'm sorry. I didn't mean any of it, you know. Okay. And so sometimes it was hard, yeah, to work things out because he changed from caring a whole bunch to not, you know. And it was just kind of a little weird. So, so let's let's uh, go to the incident where he found the picture of Charlie Pride. Was it you that found the picture or he did? Um. You know, I don't remember exactly. I I think he was looking through stuff and maybe found it. I mean, I'd always remembered that picture. He'd had it forever in our stuff, you know. Okay. And so he, at that time, he was starting to feel like his memories were off, you know. And so he was, and it, there were things about his past that he couldn't remember. You know, he always said to me, I'd ask him about his childhood. And he'd be like, I don't really remember my childhood. <laughs> and I'd be like, why not? You know, that's strange, you know, but anyway, so at that point, that was quite, you know, later, way later on in our marriage, he was starting to realize there were weird gaps in his memory and some of his memories were off, you know, right. So, 
So yeah, he found that Charlie Pie picture and he thought that um, Charlie hadn't, from what he remembered, he thought Charlie hadn't signed it. But I was like, no, he did. Cause I'd always looked at it, you know, and said, oh, he did sign it. So he was like, oh, you know, it, it shocked him. And he was like, oh, my memory is totally wrong. You'd think I'd remember something like meeting a famous musician on a trip, mm -hmm. you know? So he was worried about that. I remember <laughs> that was kind of a turning point when he was like, something's off in my past, you know? So how did things change from that point on? Well, from that point, you know, he just started to, that was a time when he was starting to remember more and more kind of odd things. Nothing really weird yet, but he remembered, he started to remember some weird things that he might have been abused by his dad, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that, that he had something weird to, had happened to him at school, he was starting to remember. And he had, um, he was supposedly in this, the slower reading group in like second grade. And, but he remembered he had to go to some kind of testing center in another part of, of Nampa, you know, separate from the school. He went to this weird building and he asked his mom about it, he asked her, and she said, oh, well, you were only there for like a day and a half. And he was like, what? <laughs> a day and a half for testing out of a reading group, you know? It was very strange. So he was starting to feel, realize something really weird had gone on. Was there and any correlation also, between the reading and the, the neurological development and the fact that he was being electroshocked all the time? I don't know, possibly, you know, or maybe they just put him, you know, I think he's always been quite smart, you know, so I don't know, maybe they just put him in that group and he really wasn't a slow reader? I don't know. Possibly. Maybe that was just an, an excuse to take him yeah. to some sort of center, because I know they do that. They make excuses yeah. to get the, the child out of their normal routine and then take them to uh, a training center. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, that's what it seems like, because, okay. yeah, they did odd things in this school group, so. <laughs> wow. Does he yeah. remember that? He does remember that some now. Yeah, he was, they would take him back to little cubicles and they would put these headphones on his ears. And he's like, well, I can't hear anything. Like he couldn't hear anything, but they said they did electromagnetic pulses through the headphones. Oh. And he would have to do it for a certain amount of time. He put a little sand, you know, a sand hourglass, sand timepiece thing he'd have to turn over that he'd have to do it for that amount of time and they'd give him these things to look at and it wasn't anything terrible in the at, in the school cubicles but he just had those weird electromagnetic pulses I guess put in his brain or yeah and then the testing center itself he was made to he remembers now that he was made to watch the Alice in Wonderland movie over and over again and they gave him some kind of drug in a little cup of juice, you know, and they would, and he remembers, he, so he was on this weird drug and they would flash <laughs> these horrid scenes in certain parts of the movie, you know, that would, it reinforces programming somehow, I guess. So what did you think of this? When he would tell you these things, what were you thinking? Because <laughs> you don't have any sort of frame of reference and you had no knowledge of it. Yeah right yeah I did it well I gradually he gradually remembered more and more over time so in the beginning it was just oh I think I was abused I think something weird happened to me you know in the beginning I was like oh is he is this for real is he losing it you know what's wrong you know but then the, the more he remembered and the more he remembered I was like yeah this seems for real and and something really bad you know <laughs> have you seen that movie Zoolander yeah, uh -huh. it just it just popped into my mind when you were talking about um, the flashes on the scenes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Zoolander the is all mind. about MK Ultra programming. So if you guys haven't yeah. seen that, go back with fresh eyes and take a look at that movie. Yeah, when I watched that after John had remembered everything, I was like, "This is all they're making fun of mind control in this." You know, totally. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> and so when we when we originally spoke, we talked a little bit about missing time. 
and that it wasn't really something that you noticed initially because it was always I have to go work or he's gone at work mm -hmm. so now looking back what are you thinking as far as was he at work do you think he was being accessed was he on missions what what was happening in your mind um yeah I think when we were very first married it was when the at the very beginning of our marriage he did have to do a couple things I think one was a failed mission with his handler <laughs> and um, I think he just said he was working late on that one and I had a small baby I was probably totally preoccup preoccupied you know, it wasn't that abnormal because he was working for his uncle who was his handler and so he just said he had to work that evening but he was actually on a mission in Boise you know he was supposed to be shooting this guy and that mission failed and his programming broke down and really? so okay. yeah yeah so after that his uncle did you know so was really angry and did like this suicide programming on him and stuff and then there was another mission where later, I think a little later, it wasn't too much later, but a little later where he went with his grand, he was with, a, where he was working up in Ketchum. So we must have been living in Fairfield at the time. And um, he went with his grandfather to do this kind of horrid mission. I mean, people can read about it on his website. It was an assassination thing, you know. And so his grandpa was kind of trying to prove that he was still an operational you know, person, because his uncle thought he wasn't, and before, his grandpa was getting really old, so I think before he died, he wanted to make sure that he was kind of exonerated, I guess, or something, or because his grandpa was actually kind of worried that, even though as horrid as his grandpa could be, he was kind of worried that Gail had done suicide programming on Johnny, you know, or JR, and so his grandpa wanted him to prove himself again. And so that was another mission he did. And I think that happened just during work. So I didn't really even know the difference at all. You know, it was just during work. And I think the guy he worked for up there was somewhat in the network. He was an LDS bishop mm -hmm. and his, uh, his handler had gotten him that job. And so I think, yeah, it was all someone from work came and got him and took him to do this mission and all this stuff. So, and he was just there in the Wood River Valley. So, I I think they, um, especially you not being programmed yourself, they know the handlers being they know how to work within the structure of keeping a. Uh, an outward routine so that it gives the appearance of everything being good. So in other words, if you're a child, a lot of the survivors are taken out of school during school hours for their programming. Or if um, like with JR, he's supposedly at work and that's when he goes off and does a mission and he comes home at the end of the day and you're none the wiser. Mm -hmm. I know. And as crazy as that sounds yeah yeah but that's how they operate yeah it is they totally try to keep it totally hidden you know and it is really hard to and there's just these like I was talking about early just these kind of strange little quirks that the person has that you don't really think about that much you know as anything that weird until <laughs> until um, after the fact you're looking at a hindsight perspective going yeah is that what I, that was now what? Sorry. So you're you're looking at it from a hindsight perspective. Yeah. Going true. In it was that just a little personality picadillo here, or was that uh -huh. that a yeah. remnant of programming? Uh huh. True. Yeah. Yeah. Now I look back and and I can see a lot of strange things, and I'm like, that was weird, but I could never figure it out. You know, I knew, knew nothing about mind control or Satanism or anything. So. So from the time you guys um, had the Charlie Pride incident with the photo and the autograph, how long was it between that time and now memories start to come forward and you guys have this whole can of worms that you're not sure what's happening now? What's the time mm -hmm. frame there? Um, I'd say in... In about a year, like it happened fairly fast. Like once his memory started to come back, kind mm -hmm. of a whole bunch of them did like over a year or two after that incident, 
you know, a whole bunch of them came back just on their own. You know, he wasn't with a therapist or anything. It just seems like his brain finally, you know, released all these things. And what was that like for, <laughs> for him and for you? I mean, what was happening when that was being revealed? Was it at night during a dream? Was it during a day? Was there a trigger? Tell us about what that process. Um, was like. You know, it's, it seems like things would start to flash in his mind. Like lots of times, just a little bit of it would come back to him, you know, at first, mm -hmm. like I remember one memory, he remembered the gun he used and the holster he strapped on and the shirt he wore first. You know, so that flashed into his mind. And then his body sometimes would start doing weird things. Like he had my memory where he got punched by this person. And so in that memory, his jaw started to get really sore and hurt. You know, like his body remembered what happened. <laughs> it was weird. But yeah, and he would just be really upset. You know, it's, they're very fresh. Like they're not like an old faded memory like most people have because they're coming out fresh. You know, so it's like it's happening over again. So it's, you know, it's very traumatic. And last times he was kind of out of it for a few days and, you know, really upset on some of them, remembering these things. And so I had to just try to support him as best I could, you know, but he had to just kind of go through it as it came out. And then some of the other things just came out more gradually as he journaled and journaled, you know. <clears throat> and got more and more details. Like he'd lots of times write the same thing over and over and more and more details would seem to come through from doing that. From getting the other details of the memory, it seems like it would help to fill in the rest of it. Or I don't know, it's interesting, but. So how did you guys go from memory starting to come forward to understanding what was going on with Project Paperclip and the MK Ultra program? How did you start making that connection? Um, when he first started remembering, he did start to think, I think I was in some kind of weird government program. And I was like, I don't know, that sounds crazy. You know, I had never heard of anything like that. And so he got the Kathy O'Brien book. He's like, I'm going to read this book and just see what she says and what this is about, you know. And we even, before we got it, kind of laughed and said, oh, mind control couldn't be real, you know. <laughs> so yeah. there's a big, the universe had a big joke in store for us, <laughs> right? <laughs> so anyway, we got the book and read it. And so then we started to connect some, you know, he started to remember more and more things and we started to connect dots with oh he was in a government program you know he was he was in the mk ultra he's remembering things like from the mk ultra type you know program and also that it came into the satanism part with the mormon church and you know i didn't know anything about that either that was a total shock and so I started to research into that. Like, is there any other evidence that, and I started like, to it, and I'm like, yeah, there is. <laughs> you so know, I, I did. How, how old were you guys and how long had you been together um, when you started researching this stuff? Let's see. He was 39 when he started remembering and I was 40. And so we'd been together, you know, about 19, 20 years. Okay. Yeah. So we were just barely getting into middle age, I guess. <laughs> okay. And so, so then you started researching and you discovered that Satanism is within the Mormon church and being practiced and mm -hmm. mind control, government mind control, not so funny. <laughs> Mm -hmm. No, <laughs> no, not very funny <laughs> because, yeah, my own husband is involved. <laughs> you know, I was really shocked to even learn mind control existed. I was kind of depressed and traumatized after I read that Kathy O'Brien book. I was like, oh, this is so horrible. This even exists. And then my own husband was having, you know, at the same time, my own husband was having more and more memories come back. And this happened to him, you know, and our family was involved. And yeah, it was a very big shock. You know, <laughs> wow. I feel like what I thought about reality was totally shattered and you know <laughs> I think if that had been me I'd be looking out the window and going okay who's who's watching even though we all know now that big brother's watching us all the time but there's a special eye on yeah. on you guys yeah and there was people watching and you know there were weird, weird things happening to us at the same time you know we were being harassed and getting weird phone calls all the time and having you know aircraft fly over our house, <laughs> which was out in the middle of nowhere and never had 
helicopters or military aircraft fly over it ever, you know, until yeah. then. And all of a sudden it was all the time, you know. Wow. Like, so just the, just the fact that he's uncovering these memories and you guys are dealing with this. Now they're putting their helicopters and okay, what's he going to do? Programming is breaking down here. Mm -hmm. We yeah, have to like keep they're trying to scare us, you know, <laughs> into being quiet or I don't know what, or, it seemed like the worst things happen when he tried to contact his family, you know, they, it seemed like they really didn't want them to be woken up to this and stuff. So, so if he can be contained mm -hmm. and he's waking up, that's one thing, but they don't want to start a domino effect in him no. tripping everybody else. They really didn't seem okay. like, cause it seemed like our worst harassment happened after he would like try to contact his siblings or his mother or something like that, you know, or. Yeah. So did it, did it ever enter into your mind or did you guys have the conversation? Will this happen to you, JR? And you didn't know about that for so many years. Is it possible that they have had access to our children and we just didn't know? Well, you know, it did cross our mind. We wondered, but I certainly hope not. You know, I don't think so. They don't show any signs of it. And we didn't spend a lot of time with JR's family or parents like we kind of lived away from them for most of our marriage I kind of always had just kind of a uh, intuition or gut instinct I really didn't want to live right next to him I just didn't want him so we lived a ways away so we didn't they didn't spend a lot of time alone with their you know extended family on that side or anything so I hope not you know right. yeah <laughs> but yeah I we did pull them out of regular school we had done homeschooling some in the past anyway, so, but we did pull them out. We're like, no, we don't want you at school. You know, we're afraid that things could happen to you there. And because JR remembers things happened to him. So we're right. just, we were just worried, you know, so. Wanted and they understood to the best of their ability or? They did. I don't know. My teenage daughter was pretty unhappy <laughs> for a while, yeah. you know, which I can understand. My youngest didn't really mind or. My oldest son didn't mind a whole lot. He was get, kind of getting into other trouble. So it was kind of good for him to get out of there. Right. <laughs> so he was at an age just kind of doing some things he shouldn't. So. so you guys were going through the healing process all on your own. You guys didn't go to therapist. He didn't have hypnotherapy to recover his memories. Is that correct? That's correct. He went to a hypnotherapist at the very beginning for a couple months. But she got kind of alarmed when she started to hear what he was remembering. She was more like the type of person to just help people quit smoking or things like that. You know, she's a nice older woman in Moscow. And plus he started to have, you know, she started weird phone calls when he was there and people coming, like weird communication personnel coming. It was just strange yeah. and all these strange things were happening. So she became kind of scared and she's like, I'm sorry, I don't think I can do this. And But he did... He did try a little bit to recover memories that way, but it didn't work for him very well. He seemed to have kind of some blocks put in. He said he'd have this weird voice come into his mind and say like, yeah, your therapist is stupid. Don't listen to her, you know, and things like that. So maybe they put some kind of block in there or... That, yeah. So that could actually be programming or maybe they were using a uh, skull uh, technology yeah, to skull. Yeah, who knows? Technology. I guess. Yeah, who knows? It, I mean, she did. He did ask her to put the suggestion into his mind that he he needed to remember to be safe, and it was safe to remember. And so he did have her hypnotize him with that. But that's about it. The rest of his memories, you know, he quit that after two months, and then the rest of his memories just kind of came back on their own. And yeah, we just kind of had to deal with them. When did he start doing the artwork? Um. He he did the artwork probably when we'd been married around 10 to 15 years. So it was before he remembered, you know. So the content of his art is reflecting his programming without consciously understanding that the programming had taken place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, he was trying to kind of, maybe his subconscious was trying to warn him, I think, really. Can we see some of it? Yeah, sure. Here is um his painting that he did. Okay. 
Yeah, that's that's a great shot. So we were talking about, tell us a little bit about what, what's in here. Because I can see a number of indications for, for programming here, but you tell us about it. Yeah, so I mean, he has, you know, some curtains that are being pulled back to reveal something hidden and some, you know, the cl the clock, the concept of time, which is always kind of important in programming, I think. And then the devil horns, you know, yeah. and the axe raised up, and the light trying to shine on it. You know, it's all, it just seems to me his subconscious current to warn him kind of, because he had had, you know, suicide programming. Yeah. And so it always, I know I was always like, that's a scary painting. <laughs> well, and he's, it looks to me like the, the curtains um, would be uh, representative of the mind or the, the veil that had been pulled over the programming. And he's working to shine the light through the programming and what he's uncovering is the yeah. mind control. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh -huh. And he said when he did art, he would always think, let your subconscious mind say, do whatever it wants. Like he would think that to himself. So it does seem like it was trying to warn him. Wow. And you know what? I just, I didn't notice this because we only took a quick peek um, when you and I uh, originally spoke, but I find the sleeves on the arms interesting because oftentimes in satanic rituals and stuff, uh, they're wearing robes and that looks more indicative of the, the dark robes. Yes. And I don't know, maybe right. I'm reading they do Kind of look like a robe. Yeah. Maybe I mean, I'm reading too much into it, but it just, yeah. I find it interesting. Yeah. And he did take part in things that were, they wore robes, you know? So. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Thank you so, for showing us that. Yeah. You're welcome. I know. I think it shows. Any other pieces that you've got? Yeah. I've got a couple more here. I have this little drawing that he did. Okay. I see that. It's got, um, yeah. got Mickey Mouse, you know, and he's got a Masonic checkerboard pattern thing yeah. going around him. Mickey Mouse with like a hole in him, you know, <laughs> kind of weird. And it says on it, no, why? I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, like, I no, see that. Why? You know, and there's like a worm going through everything. What's so going on at the top of the picture with all the, the bubbles and it's got a dark center in the middle? What What's all uh, of that? That kind of looks like this flower that just goes on and on, like this infinite flower type of thing or something. I don't know. So interesting. It just seems like there are a lot of things in his mind. Yeah. I, I find the tomorrow. checkerboard, oh, the Mason, <laughs> yeah, the Masonic checkerboard interesting. Because you've got the duality, the light and yeah, the dark. Yeah, me too. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, light and the dark. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and then Mickey Mouse, of course, Disney you know, is a big part of his. Yeah. Programming. Then there's just this one where it's just kind of this poor guy with a another Masonic chest checkerboard with a poor, just a face looking like, you know, it's being squeezed and tortured or something it looks like. But that, that looks like hypnosis, like the hypnotic state that they put individuals in in order yeah, to Yeah, that's true, them. too. Yeah, good point. Yeah, it is that way, too, I would say. Mm. And, and like I mentioned earlier with Zoolander, we see a lot of the spinning and spinning and swirls that they use in order mm -hmm. to hypnotize the individual and get them into an altered state. So mm -hmm. that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I thought those were all you know <laughs> what did you think when he would do that art what were you thinking I thought it was kind of weird you know but I didn't know anything about MK ultra programming or anything you know I thought the painting was kind of scary I was always like I don't really want to hang that up anywhere <laughs> <laughs> you know I just didn't know but yeah I thought it was weird but I just couldn't you know, our life on the surface seems so fine. Yeah. You know, and his family seemed all okay on the surface, you know, so I just didn't connect the dots at all. He could be the deprogramming Picasso. You never know. Yeah. Remind people that this artwork was before the discovery of the of the MK Ultra. This is what was coming out of his subconscious. And he was just going with it. Yeah, long, long before, really. Yeah. 
So there was a lot in his subconscious <laughs> trying to come out. That's for sure. When I, yeah, later I I look at those paint that painting. I'd be like, <laughs> now I understand. You know. Wow, and I bet that's been very cathartic in many ways. Yeah, it has been. You know, it's definitely kind of seems like something that kind of proves. <laughs> some word was going on to me yeah so. so what did you guys do when these things started to come forward how did you handle the family relations I know you guys weren't living uh close by but did you confront the family what what did you do uh, about that JR called when he started first to remember and started to get worried about it all that something was wrong with his past you know, and that he had maybe been abused. He did conf call his mom and talk to her and kind of confront her. And um, she, she, you know, she said, oh, well, I will talk to your dad about this, you know, and stuff. And, and so, but then we didn't hear back from him or anything. And then they did send um, the police out to our house to see if he was suicidal and homicidal. So that was a point for me that was, I was like, oh, that's really strange, you know, because when he talked to his mom, he didn't really sound suicidal or homicidal or he never said anything like that, you know. So when that happened, I was like, oh, that's scary because I had just been reading about mind control that people who wake up are supposed to be suicidal and homicidal, you know. Right. So that scared me. I was like, that's really weird. And, you know, and he also tried to talk some to his siblings and tell them, you know, at first he just talked to him and they told him some kind of funny things like, like his sister said that his dad had pinched her rear when she was a teenager, you know, late, an older teenager. And that his mom and dad had both like kissed her on the lips goodnight when she was a teen, you know, older, you know, for bed and stuff. And so, so there were just some kind of things. There's nothing really strange, but some kind of strange things. And then his other brother told him that he thought his their childhood had been terrible and he blocked it out. And so all these things kind of surprised Johnny or JR at that point because he thought his childhood had been pretty nice and their family had been pretty good, you know, <laughs> or in his conscious mind. And so he was surprised. And his sister said stuff like she didn't trust their parents and she didn't like to leave her kids with them alone. And so we were surprised to hear that stuff because we thought they were really close, you know, and they lived right by each other. And, did things together all the time I thought but, so that was surprising and then later you know and as he remembered more and more we um <laughs> we got kind of you know scary stuff he's remembering so we pretty much cut off contact with his parents his dad pretty much never you know replied to anything or ever he just seemed to kind of avoid everything and they made up they kind of made this storyline that we were you know, as he started to remember more and more that we were insane and we were on drugs, we had this hard drug lifestyle, <laughs> I guess, you know, I never knew I had. A... <laughs> yeah. So anyway, <laughs> so that's what they told his siblings and everything. <laughs> and so anyway, and they believed that, I don't know why, like, honestly, I don't think there was a lot of indications that we were these crazy drug people, you know. <laughs> You know, when I left the church, I had an aunt who accused me of being a, a drunken Babylonian whore. <laughs> oh, wow. Even though I'd never had any alcohol at that point. So I was oh, like, man. hey. <laughs> yeah, all right. I know. So I know. I think when you are, we were not Mormon. So I think we were always kind of categorized as, ooh, maybe they're doing something bad. You know, people all the time. Yeah people are still in Mormonism and they think people leave to go do something bad I think sometimes and so I don't know it's a license for licentiousness yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so were you guys at that point um talking to his sister and sharing information or were you start now that he's recovering his memories the behavior of the sister is making more sense in your mind going, okay, well, now I'm understanding why his sister is not having a close relationship to the family. What did that do for validating JR and the relationship there? Well, he started to, yeah, to understand that maybe there was something, you know, underlying. <laughs> yeah, he started to see there's something underlyingly really bad, you know, and as he tried to tell them more and more, you know, it got to 
I think too extreme for them. They just couldn't believe it. You know, it's too out there. So they, <clears throat> you know, they they just believed what his parents said, it seemed like. And, you know, they would, for a while, his sister would act like she was nice and supportive. And then, but then he found out behind his back, he was just saying, she was just saying he was crazy, you know. And so we, I just, I told him, you know, this is so toxic to have any kind of contact with these people. You know, this, yeah. this isn't good for your mental sanity, I don't think. And so we did just kind of cut off contact. Like his one brother would text these really kind of mean things like that, that he had schizophrenia, you know, and stuff like that. And so I was, finally we changed our phone numbers and just, you know, so we didn't have to have that anymore. What about your parents and your side of the family? What? What do they think of um, going on? Yeah, when I, you know, at the beginning when it first started, and we were getting harassed with airplanes and weird phone calls. He was remembering all this terrible stuff. Of course, I was very upset, you know. And I tried to tell, tried to tell my siblings. My dad passed away a long time ago, and my mom um, has memory issues, so she's not really. She's elderly and has kind of some dementia problems, so she wasn't able to hear anything like that. But I tried to tell some of my siblings. I wrote him some letters and stuff. And, and at first, you know, they just ignored me. <laughs> so I got kind of mad at them. I was like, geez, I need some support here, you know? And so they called and kind of did like a very surface level, little tiny bit of support, you know? But they didn't really seem like take me seriously about like the mind control stuff or the Satanism stuff. They kind of seemed to just believe maybe he'd been abused and his family was bad, you know, but that was a, about it. They wouldn't listen to me about the other stuff, you know. And so, yeah, I felt kind of, kind of unsupported and alone, you know, in a bad situation, I felt like. So, because I felt like JR's family is making up this good story about us and we were kind of having these scary things happen to us. And I was like, Oh, I hope nothing happens to us, you know. So you're trying to support Jr., but needing a little support from your family because you don't know what. Uh, I mean, how do you get through something like this? Yeah, exactly. It would have been nice to have someone to talk to. <laughs> Feel like yeah. somebody was taking me seriously in in case something happened to us, you know? Because I mean, there were some signs that they were trying to kind of smear us and get rid of us I mean, through maybe. JR's programming himself or through other people you know there were some scary incidents so I was yeah I was you know in a bad situation and yeah I wish they would have believed me but it just seemed like they couldn't fathom that that could be real you know you know I there have been some comments um in a couple of the videos where viewers have said well I grew up LDS and this never happened in my family so this is this is so outlandish I have a hard time believing it and what's important for people to understand is this is not across the board for every LDS family or every bloodline or family there mm -hmm. are select few for particular mm -hmm. reasons and so yeah. if you if this isn't your experience and we pray to god that it's not it's mm -hmm. it's so far out there because it's so heinous that of course you reject it this is not how normal humans behave no <laughs> and so how were how were things with your your children when they were you know witnessing this stuff and you guys are trying to deal with the memories what was yeah we were they were, you know, traumatized. I think at a certain extent, they were all young. And when you're young, they kind of a little bit just couldn't take it. So sort of disassociated away from it, you know, like lots of times you do when you're a younger person. Sometimes you just can't take certain things. It's just yeah. too much, it seems like, you know. So they did that to a certain extent. They were teenagers and you know, you're kind of so centered as a teenager. <laughs> but maybe in a way that was all right because, you know, they just couldn't quite handle all that. Although they believed and you know they saw what was happening and they you know felt bad for jr and everything yeah. felt bad for them and and all that but they did kind of you know we tried to kind of shield them from the worst horrid details and everything and and all that kind of stuff and so they were traumatized you know and to learn that their grandparents were you know secretly bad and you know yeah. did horrid things to their dad and you know, it was traumatic you know we didn't have a super close relationship but still and then to lose all those normal, you know, relationships with your extended family, it's kind of sad. You become kind of isolated, you know. Yeah. 
and even with my own, I kind of distanced myself from my family because I was kind of angry with them for, you know, right. treating me that way. And so, and then we moved. So that was kind of a little hard. You, know, you had to totally readjust. And so, yeah. Kind Have of any of the kids read the website? Your dad, um, their dad's journal. Um, yeah, I think they have read parts, some of it. Uh -huh. I know my old, I think my son, my oldest son has read quite a bit. And my, uh, my oldest daughter <clears throat> has read some, but she's like, she gets really, you know, traumatized. So she's like, oh, some of it, I just don't, it's so terrible that it happened to dad, you know? Yeah. So, and I'm going to guess, of course, no, she's too young. So, <laughs> wow. okay. Really so so can I ask what this has done in terms of any spiritual development that that you have um either done or not done for yourself or with JR because coming out of and working with a lot of individuals that have exited whether it's Mormonism or any other cult like um, organization, there can be a faith crisis. And sometimes people will immediately cling on to another religion to replace it, or they the pendulum can swing in the exact opposite direction. And now they are atheist or agnostic for a while. And it might even be a long while. So what has this done, if it's okay to ask, to any sort of spiritual development that you guys have tried to foster? Um, you know, for us, I think in a way it has made us more spiritual or more to, for me. And I think JR too kind of more connected to God in a way, or maybe kind of our own concept of God. But I don't know we had left the church long before. And so we kind of had had our own ideas about religion for a long time anyway. So he had been kind of maybe just sort of agnostic for a long time, although he did start to believe in like something a few years before he remembered. And I had been kind of, kind of an atheist or agnostic after I had been Mormon the early years of my life then because I was just kind of like religion blah you know but then I kind of got into sort of new agey stuff and like yoga I like yoga and the traditional teachings of that kind of stuff and, and so when this all happened I think for JR he just you know as he was really super traumatized and everything but he did he did remember that uh near-death experience he had and so i think that really kind of gave him some strength and made him feel closer to some kind of spiritual element because he felt like he had really experienced that there was something else and you know maybe everything would be okay in the end there is some kind of power you know yeah maybe, has that been part know. of the healing equation I think it has. Yeah, I think it does give him strength, you know, that at least everything will be all right, you know, yeah. and in the end, and there's something, some higher power that will sort everything out in the end, you know, he feels like, I think. For me, it was kind of disturbing because after I learned about all this stuff, I was like, I had been kind of new agey, so I learned, yeah. oh, the new agey stuff is kind of bunk on you know? <laughs> So that was kind of hard for me. Like I was really kind of attached to it, you know. <laughs> and so I learned, oh, that's not really very true. So, but I still felt like, you know, just things happening in our life that there was some kind of force kind of guiding us and helping us, I felt like, and keeping us safe. So I do do still believe in something. And yeah, you know, I've kind of become more interested, honestly, in like um in just regular Christianity, which is I always thought that was dumb you know and <laughs> I didn't like that at all but now I'm kind of interested in that so although with a big dose of who the heck knows I'm not I wouldn't ever go to church and totally believe everything they say and yeah you know, do whatever some organization told me to do but Right. And I think that's typical. I, I know it was for me and it has been with a lot of individuals that I work with because um, a religion, whether it's Mormonism or Catholicism, or if you're a Muslim, you have a very definite definition and pictorial of what God looks like. And so when you move away from that, it's like now your canvas is completely empty for the most part, because you don't know what it's supposed to look like, or if this person 
person even exists. And mm -hmm. so trying to figure that out on top of, you know, everything else, because we're taught to draw upon the divine for any troubles and things like that. And so when that's obliterated, it, mm -hmm. it can leave you swinging, feeling completely unsecure. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> <Make here. laughs> but that's that's good to know and everybody has their own spiritual um and i think that's part of what uh the humanistic philosophy has been uh, or was appealing to me and i st i still buy into that a bit where there are as many ways to the divine or god as there are people on the planet we all have our own personal relationship with with uh, our consciousness or our divine spark and mm -hmm. so it, that presence for the healing process, I think has been very helpful in many survivors, no matter what the definition looks like, they have to repaint that for themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, the process, you know, got to yeah. search for the truth yourself. But... Whether you've been traumatized or not. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. Very true. But for even more for people who have, I guess. But... Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So where are things now with you guys in the healing process? Oh, I would say, you know, we're doing better. <laughs> Definitely after those first few shocking and dramatic years, you know, and we, you know, we moved and so we moved somewhere where it's a lot more peaceful and we aren't really harassed all the time. And so that's been nice. And we've been able to kind of settle in and, you know, feel more at peace with everything. And and able to move on with life you know at first you're so angry you know and, and just resentful you know i just was so angry that they had done that to him and you mm. know and so was he and <laughs> so but you can only stay that way for so long or you make yourself sick right and <laughs> right so you know it's time to kind of move on from that and actually enjoy your life and your presence and you know working with trying to work past that and everything is what we've been working on i mean it's still hard sometimes but how many years has it been now between it's the been, start and then today? It's been about six years, a little more than six years. So, wow. With some time, you know, we feel quite a bit better than, you know, the pictures of JR when he first remembered. I mean, he got so thin and looked terrible, you know, mm. <laughs> it was bad. So. Yeah, looked like a chain smoking. <laughs> We're like, we like, you look like a chain smoking trucker, you know. <laughs> like just something awful happened. But he's and now you wish the issue was only smoking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So, I know. I still need to quit smoking, but <laughs> so have you guys I'm... been able to connect with other survivors, or do you feel like that that's more triggering or more healing? Um, you know, he's connected a little bit with uh, Christy Allen, and that seems like it's kind of nice. He just chats with her about his life, you know, and stuff, and, you know, they just have that in common that that's happened to them. I don't think, you know, there's very many people out there, so it's kind of nice to find someone who has that in common, so, but he has always kind of avoided reading in depth in other people's memories and things like that, so that he doesn't get contaminated yeah. memories or triggered right. or you know, or he gets really traumatized, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and stuff, so. Would it surprise you if I told you that over 2 million people have been um, trauma-based mind control? I mean, they're soft, they're Satanism, and that's, we're talking like 12 million plus in the mm -hmm. United States, but then there's uh, at least 2 million that have been through the MK program. I know that is crazy, you know, I, I think I've read that somewhere, but yeah, it's hard to even, you know, and with like with JR, they could be going through life and no one would even notice, you know, there's just right. these little things that you think are a little odd. Yeah. And you have to know them pretty well, you know, so I know it's, it's awful, really two million. Maybe. Isn't that a lot? And you know, a lot of people, now listeners, don't get yourself twisted over this, but a lot of these individuals who are involved in the, the false flag operations, like the school shootings and different traumas, you see their pictures. Who was that? The, um, the killer in the theater. And it was for the Batman, Dark Man Rising or something like that. Did you see his photo? He's got the wild MK Ultra eyes and the drugged out. Yeah, he seemed odd. Yeah, he definitely yeah. seemed 
something weird might have been going on with him. Yeah, that one screams programming to me. Yeah, some of them really do. Yeah, to us too. We always, because JR remembers, you know, Bird talking about the hot, like making an army of, you know, people that do shootings. and. Yeah, they, um, I, gosh, and if, if I had thought I was going to mention this, I would have made sure I had the name right, but I think it might be Tizdar or uh, Tiz, Russ Tizdar or something like that. I've got his book that I read several years ago on sleeper cell programming. So they program these individuals and then the programming goes dormant or it's hidden in there. And then at a particular time, then it's it's called to the forefront and activated. And I think we're seeing a lot of that now. Rest his star. OK, I'll have to come up with that one. Um, but uh when a particular time happens, then their programming comes to a forefront. And now we're seeing all these individuals acting in ways that are not typical. They're not normal. And I'm wondering how many of these incidences are due to sleeper cell programming. Yeah. Yeah. You do have to wonder <laughs> for sure, yeah. because I know all the shootings lately. I mean, there's so many lately. Just, yeah. It's, yeah. And I know that there's a reason for that because they want to take away the second amendment and, and all of that stuff. So now they're shooting children and, you know, mm. pregnant women and things like that. Things that cause more of an emotional response. Yeah. Where everyone's just like, Oh, um, it's beyond awful. I know it is awful. I mean, one thing I would just tell people is before you react emotionally, just sit back and wait because the facts always come, especially if you go digging, you know, you do a deep dive into these mm. uh, situations. Um, they want that emotional response immediately so that we've got that fear going on and people want to mm. respond and react. But I promise you, if you'll just sit back and wait the facts emerge and it's never what we really think it is. Yeah, most of the time, I know if you research these people's connections or their background or, you know, most yeah. times they're for sure. Yeah, I know. What would you recommend for people uh, in terms of the healing process for themselves or for loved ones that they are with? So whether it's trauma-based or whether they're they're dealing with sexual abuse or horrific abuse, as somebody who's had to walk through the supportive role, how do we support these individuals in their daily lives? I think, you know, just give them a lot of love and and be, you know, patient and understanding because sometimes, you know, they can have things that are hard to deal with and stuff. And but, you know, you have to understand what they've been through and be patient and not get, you know, too impatient with and irritable about it, you know, and stuff. And yeah. try to love and support them, I guess, is the best, really. And give them time to do their healing things, you know, and everything. Wow. That's That's, it's a lot, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And research, you gotta, you gotta be willing to dig for the answers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, some of these things, like I showed, if you know anyone that's, you know, doing that kind of art or acting oddly, you might wanna. Thank you so that. much for sharing this part of the healing process with us. Any yeah. parting words? Um, I would say, you know, just to anyone out there who's suffering, like it's possible to heal. It's possible you know, to get past this kind of stuff and get away from your abusers. And, you know, human beings aren't just, like we have a book with one of Johnny's programmers called, it's called Programming the Human Biocomputer, you know? <laughs> and it's like, human beings aren't just biocomputers. We have, my, you know, our experiences really taught us there's something else, there's some kind of divine spark and you can yeah. get, you can heal from really awful things, you know? And, isn't that amazing that what you can overcome? It is. Yeah, I think so. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's yeah. it's very inspirational. One of the one of the things even though it can be a lot to work with the different survivors and talk with them and go through the therapy section uh sessions because it's it's a lot, you know, and as mm -hmm. an empath I have to remember to hold myself and not lose my energy within that because it you know, I don't want to be sick um from mm -hmm. the from the physical stuff and the emotional stuff uh, I think I lost my train of thought on that but um 
<laughs> working <laughs> working with these individuals, I really did lose my train of thought. Um, do you know what I was saying? You were saying it's just a lot to work with people like that. You know, it can be hard when you're empathic, so you don't get sucked into it too much, I guess. Or oh trouble. my goodness. Well, that doesn't happen very often, but when <laughs> Working with these individuals, um, I think it can be um, amazing to draw from their strength. Because, and that's one thing that I have found. That's what was, that was my thought over and over again. Um, one of the things that I absolutely love and admire about each of these individuals is their internal strength that they have. And I think that's what's carried them through the abuse and what allows them to ultimately uh, put their lives in a more conscious orderly um, fashion rather than being controlled. They get to reverse that situation and now their mm -hmm. strength steps forward and allows them to take control. And I think that is so admirable. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is too. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you, Madeline. It's nice talking to you. <laughs> oh, well, we appreciate the insight because there's a lot that we can learn. I will, uh, for the listeners, put uh, JR's website in the description box, Mormon Monarch. And I believe you have some information out there as well. Is that correct? Yeah, I have a little website called LDS Mind Control. Okay. Com. So ldsmindcontrol.com yeah where i just talk about our experience and just some stuff about the mormon church and okay. Google, stuff like that great well i will include that in the description box as well uh like and and subscribe i always have a tough time with that word i say describe when it should be subscribe and uh -huh. just for you guys, um, if something happens to the YouTube channel, I have recently started uploading on Rumble, but my username on there is Eden Rocks, E-D-E-N Rocks, okay? So there's the backup channel. You can always reach me at galacticstoryteller at gmail.com. Like and subscribe and leave your comments below. Be kind. If you have a differing opinion, I am totally fine with that. Please provide resources and facts so that we can have a discussion on this. Our objective here is to learn and to grow. So take care and we will see you guys in the next video.